Dear God, we do thank you for being present. We thank you that you speak to and through us. God, we ask today that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would open our ears to hear how your spirit is speaking to us today. Would you continue to bring to mind the songs you've placed on our hearts, the melodies you've sung over us? Would you be present? And may we, your people, sense and feel your presence like never before. We give you this space and ask God that you would have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we took a look at Esther 1 through 2, and we met Vashti, Mordecai, and Hadassah. We looked at the ways they resisted and had to conform. We talked about the ways that people who are misrecognized for who they are may have to shift or code switch, pass, or assimilate in order to be accepted. We looked at Vashti and her courage to say no to being objectified. We looked at Mordecai and his relationship with his cousin who becomes his adopted daughter. We looked at what it means to show up as a father, even when you have made a mistake. We looked at Hadessa and how she went from her Gentile name, Esther, and passes as a Gentile by concealing her Jewish identity, sometimes something her father had told her to do. We talked about how in oppression, in places um, where we may just be trying to figure out how to survive, we can sometimes do things to simply survive. I encouraged us to begin to look not just at why people are doing what they do, but the situations that may place them in places where they have to compromise who they are. We discussed the ways we need to resist by affirming that we reflect the image of God, by speaking truths over and about ourselves. This week we'll continue in the series from Hadessa to Esther, the struggle for identity, by going into part two, preparing to stand in Esther chapter four. Esther is a leader. In our culture, when we think about kings and queens, we think of rulers and leaders, and we equate them as a leader. Not just a, a position that they've born into or birthright, but we see them as leader. But sometimes I think when we look at Esther, we don't necessarily see her as a leader. We see her as a trophy wife, a beauty pageant winner, a pawn used by men in the story. But leader isn't necessarily the first word that comes to mind. Yet as we journey through this passage in Esther 4, we will begin to see that the leader that is emerging in her as she struggles for her identity and prepares to take a stand. Taking a stand isn't a foreign concept to us. When we were younger, when I was younger, you know, like infants and toddlers, we took stands all day long. We demanded with our cries and our tears what we would and would not eat. We demanded with our cries and tears the toys and things that we thought would bring us joy. We took stand against our parents like the best of them. And as we got older, we began to take our cues from the adults and the people around us that told us our open rebellion against fruits and vegetables, naps and playtimes would not be tolerated. Time out or toys being taken away or even frowns or words or things sometimes harsh or stern told us we better get in line. We better do what we were told and go with the flow. Eventually, we learned how not to create too much trouble. Then we became teenagers. Against the tide, against what is considered the norm, to do so in these situations is never really an easy thing to do, not for any of us. Most of the time, we reconcile the fact that to take a stand will involve some level of vulnerability. It will require us to move beyond our comfort zone. That's not something, it's something we may not ever want to do. 
but we must ask if it's something we should do. Shortly after Esther gets married to the king in chapter 2, we learn that Mordecai sits at the king's gate. He is one of the officials. He holds this position of influence in the government. Mordecai kind of reminds me of theirs from Games of Thrones. And he's like the master of whispers. He somehow knows everything that is going on. He's not just book smart. He's street smart. He knows the custom. He knows who is who and what is going on. And while in this position, he learns that there's a plot against the king to kill the king. He takes this information to Esther, who takes it to the king, and they write it down. And it's around this time in the 12th year of King Cersei's reign, five years into this marriage as a queen, that we meet this man named Haman, an Amalekite, an enemy of the Jew, who's been raised to a position as the hand of the king, who will oversee the affairs of the king on a consistent and daily basis. In chapter 3, King Asersi's orders that all people, all the officials of the king's gates are to kneel down and pay homage to um, Haman. Mordecai doesn't. All the officials are trying to ask and understand, why are you not just going to bow down? He refuses, and all he says is, it's because he's a Jew. It's not that Jews can't bow down to pay respect for a king. It's not a signal of worship. Most commentators have argued that Mordecai's refusal has more to do with tribal, personal, and racial strife between Mordecai the Jew and Haman the Amalekite, the enemy of the Jew. The Amalekites were Israelites' arch nemesis. They had preyed on the Israelites during their wandering in the desert at their weakest point. These two tribes were consistently at war. The Amalekites represented oppression. They represented the ways Israel felt taken advantage of. To bow down in some ways, to pay homage, to give respect to this man whose forefathers had sought destruction for his family was something Mordecai refused to do. And in so doing, Haman is filled with rage. And he doesn't just want to punish Mordecai. He wants to punish all of the Jewish people throughout the entire kingdom. Haman begins to plot and to orchestrate this government-sanctioned persecution of all the Jews. Haman uses his influence, his position, his power, his relationship with the king, along with money. Some have said he's offering up to two-thirds of the annual kingdom's income to go into the king's purse in order to give him permission to persecute the Jews. In Esther 3.8, as he's trying to get the king to go along, he tells the king in verse 3 that there is this certain people, making sure not to tell the king specifically who these people are. He wants them to always be an other without a face and without a name. He embellishes on the truth and saying they don't obey the law. This certain group of people chooses to live separate. They're choosing to follow their customs and are not adhering to everyone else's norms. These people have chosen to separate themselves and are refusing to assimilate into the norms that are Persian. And, and to let them do so is to destroy you, king, the king. It's not right for you, the king, to have to deal or tolerate with these people. So let me take care of them for you. And let an edict go out that says on a certain day, we will take up arms and destroy these people on your behalf. And when Mordecai hears about the plot, the exchange of money, the edict, he weeps. He mourns and he takes a stand. He tore off his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. There's both a lament and a mourning in this act. And it's a public act. Not something he does in the privacy of his home, but he takes it to the king's gate. He's decided to stand in rebellion 
to lament all of what is happening to him and his people, to seek justice from the king. For him to engage in this act was a public act of rebellion, asking for the king to look and see that his life does matter, that his people do matter, and to take notice. There's mourning in it, but there's also this revolution act of rebelling against. And there is a collective weeping throughout all of the kingdoms. All the Jews are recognizing this, that this is happening. Here again, at a weak point in their history, the Amalekites have risen to a place of power and prominence in order to try to influence the fate of their lives. So collectively, they cry out. Collectively, they weep. Collectively, they ask if they matter. And so it is here Esther enters into into the scene as Mordecai weeps at the gates. In Esther 4.4, Esther's servants tell her what Mordecai is doing. Esther hears of this news and she sends him clothes to wear. Maybe it's not her wanting to draw too much attention to her. Maybe she's afraid for his life to be doing what he's doing in this rebellious way. Or maybe she wanted him to put on clothes, come inside the gate, and tell her what the heck is going on. That's what they had been doing all these years, communicating. But Mordecai refused to receive the clothes. His refusal is not just about him because he understands it's about an entire community, his people. And he realizes she, he's got to get her attention. So she sends a messenger and says, I need to understand more. In verse seven, it says, and Mordecai told him, that is the the eunuch she sends, all that had happened to him. And the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into king, to the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written, written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther. Esther explained it to, es- explained it to her and charged her, people, and charged her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for her people. Verse 9. Hatacha went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatacha and gave him a message for Mordecai saying, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone May that person live. I myself have not been called to come to the king for 30 days. In verse 8, Mordecai has three actions he wants to communicate to the eunuch, to Esther. He wants her to be shown this edict. He wants her to see with her own eyes what has been proclaimed. He wants to inform her of the price that has been played and paid in this backroom dealing on the heads of all of the Jews. And he wants to command her to use her position to do something about it. It isn't really clear if she knew about the edict before Mordecai shows up at the gate. She may have heard and not known just how to respond. She had been concealing her Jewish identity, her heritage, all these years. Should she stop now? In verse 11, she responds, but doesn't say what she will or will not do. Instead, she lays out the obstacles. She's stating the obvious. She's stating this isn't a wise thing to do. She's pointing out that everybody, including Mordecai, had to know that she can't just go into into the king's house, into the king's room. To do so could be her undoing, could be her death. It wouldn't be like Vashti being sent away. It could end her life. And she kind of thinks the king's kind of grown tired of her. It's been like 30 days and he hasn't summoned her. To be summoned was... To be on, to go in unsummoned could mean life or death. 
That sounds like foolishness. She had to know about what happened to Vashti. She had to know about all of these rules. She's not saying she won't go. She's pointing out the obvious to him that this doesn't sound very wise. Based on this exchange, we know she's educated. She could read. She could understand the law. She'd been raised by this wise sage, after all. Haman has shown his hand. He, and so now they have a time to mount a defense. Maybe she knew about the edict and was trying to come to terms with what to do. It'd be extremely difficult for us to assume she didn't know. What she didn't know at this point was how to stand. How was she supposed to respond? Esther, as a leader, leads differently. She's reflective and measured, unlike Haman and the king, who are reactionary and impulsive. They're moved by emotions and what ifs. She's moved by relationships and what is. And moving on in verse 12, it reads, when they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do you think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews? For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. In verse 12, Mordecai responds to Esther by reminding her that while she may escape the mob the first go around, how long will she be able to escape if Haman learns who she is? She can't escape her heritage. Mordecai has had a moment of realizing that it doesn't matter how high you climb, you can't deny who you are. He's had a moment of realizing that at some point, people will label you, typecast you, place you in a box, a paradigm, even when you've shifted past and assimilated. Why? Because you can't hide who you are. And people will choose to despise you because of you, just because. When that happens, you have no choice but to stand. He's telling her that she can't hide her ethnic heritage. She can't hide it's a part of who she is. She can't hide her faith. It's a part of who she is. I think in some ways he's acknowledging that he's encouraged this concealing for so long. And he's seeing that in a season maybe it worked, but it can't work any longer. At the same time, he's letting her know that maybe, just maybe, she's in this palace, in this position for such a time as this. Maybe she's there for this moment in time in her people's history to act as Moses acted and go before the king, the ruler, and seek deliverance for her people. He's trying to help her to see that there are some situations and circumstances even we may not have wanted to be put in, but it's our lot. And we have to figure out how to navigate through it. It is what it is. And maybe, just maybe, this is why she is where she is in this place of some power and influence. Her position maybe can help turn the tide. Beloved, unfortunately, there are edicts like this and laws that are around today. They don't literally tell us to go kill X, Y, and Z. They may say things like, you can stand your ground. If you feel threatened, you can take someone else's life. There are these laws that say lethal force is acceptable, which can and has led to the death of a lot of unarmed black bodies. And then there's this, this panic defense 
that allows people who assault those who are gay or transgender and use this idea that I just panicked and I couldn't help myself but to attack them because they came on to me. And they use it as a defense, a legal defense. And they've been using it since 1960 in about half the states of the United States. And only eight states have banned this as a use of a defense. That eighth state was added this week in New York. Beloved, the problem is we can become so desensitized and oversaturated by information that we become numb to what is happening unless it's happening to us personally. I have to confess, I know mostly about what's happening to black women. I'm married, heterosexual, and able-bodied. But it's through my relationships with my brothers and sisters who are not like me that I can begin to see the ways these laws and edicts are going out and there is harm being done to their bodies as well. And as children of God, aren't we called to stand against those laws? Martin Nemo, the Lutheran pastor in Germany, said when reflecting on the war, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Beloved, we must remember to not wait for them to come to us, but we must learn how and when we must take a stand for ourselves and those around us. Mordecai lets her know that even if she decides not to act, not to go in before the king, relief or deliverance for the Jews would arise in another way. While God is not mentioned in this passage, we see that within this and other situation, God is inviting us, his people, into God's purposes. But we must be wise. We must discern wisely what those purposes are and how to respond. We must understand that Christ came not just for atonement, but to restore we are a part of God's plan and purpose. That means restoration is not just about our personal restoration to God. But it's a restoration of all of humanity. All of earth is crying in eager anticipation of the return of Christ for it all to be restored. That means we must look not just at the birth and death of Jesus, but look at his life, which the gospel spend more time talking about his life than his birth and death. When we look at the life of Jesus, we see Jesus time and time again taking a stand for the least of these. Restoring and moving all things that see and seek to restore the humanity of God in all of his people. Even as we sang this morning that we will do as you have done. When we look at the life of Jesus, we see he's showing us his new radical ministry to bring release to the captive, to bring freedom, to bring healing, to heal the broken, to usher in a new way of being and doing, not because it's trending. Not because it's popular, but because that's what his life was about. And as followers of Christ, we too must follow and seek wisdom on how it is we are to stand. Or will we turn a blind eye towards those things that we see until they come for us? In verse 15, we see Esther respond to Mordecai. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. 
And so in, Est, in, verse, in Esther, verse 15, Esther speaks. And we begin to see and understand her plan, the plan that she's thought about, that she's been measured about, the plan that she communicates. And it begins with her reconnecting to her community. She reconnects to her heritage. She reconnects with her faith. She steps into the role as a leader by commanding all these things to take place. She's orchestrating what will happen next. And she seeks the presence, the face of God, not by herself, but with the people of God. She's reconnecting with her community by asking that all the people fast for and with her. For three days, she was reconnecting back to her people, back to her heritage, back to the way that they knew how to seek God. She's reconnecting. She's gathering all those around her and to have a fast in order to prepare to go into the king. She has this kind of resolve that even if she perishes, she will perish. According to one commentator, this statement, if I perish, I perish, recognizes the possibility of failure, yet also expresses a hope with the certainty of success. She picks faith over fear. In Hebrews 11.1, it says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. She has no idea what will happen when she steps into that room before the king. She has no idea, and so she's not going to go in there alone. She's going to seek the face of God and take everything within her spiritual capacity to help her go and take a stand. This is the faith that, like Daniel and, and the men said, If we perish in the fire, so be it. God will deliver us in another way. She calls a fast, a time of consecration, a time of setting apart to seek the face of God. Even knowing that fasting probably would alter her beautiful face and appearance because she knows she's more than just a beautiful face. Maybe she knows that in the presence of God, we have the ability to enlarge our perspective and begin to see things rightly. In the same way Esther enters into the presence of God with the community in order to prepare to go before the king. And she leads her people through this process, seeing the situation and seeking to move forward. And we hear that in verse 17, for the first time, Mordecai is listening and he's following her lead. She's made a decision to give herself, her all for her people. She's made a decision to put her body on the line. For Esther to be able to do this, she had to come to terms and acknowledge who she was. That meant she had to embrace her heritage before she could take a stand. She had to embrace who she was and all of what that meant. Her history, her legacy, her people. If we are going to lead, then if she was going to lead them, she had to be able to connect with them and know them not just as a queen, but as them as her people. Part of our reconciliation and restoration with God is that we are being made new in order to walk in the fullness of who God has created us to be. It's in this new found freedom. Sometimes for people of color, this means coming to terms and learning to love and embrace your racial heritage like Esther had to do and going through our own racial identity development. In chapter 2 of the book of Esther, we see the ways that Esther, having been misrecognized, unseen for who she was, instructed by her father, had to pass and assimilate it in this pre-encounter phase and go through it all in order to be accepted by dominant culture. In chapters 3 and 4, both Mordecai and Esther are in this encounter mode. They both come to a point based on the events in their life that says they can no longer pass. They can no longer deny their ethnic national heritage. They can no longer deny their, their faith. They have got to recognize they have always and always will be Jewish. 
And here in this chapter, there is an immersion of sorts as she's embracing her community, surrounding herself with the custom and linking herself back to the community in this act of fasting, in this act of calling and gathering. There is a reconciliation that begins to take place within her, within her own identity as she begins to internalize these things. This is as much a part of her preparing to take a stand. She's understanding who she is. She has to be able to reconcile the multiple pieces of her identity to understand all of what she's standing for because she's putting it all on the line. That's how she's preparing to take a stand. I've always known I was black. It's kind of obvious, right? But I haven't always accepted that it was okay to be black, to be a woman. I didn't realize for a very long time that I thought my blackness was something to be ashamed of. People called me blackie, darkie, and I was told I do things like a girl. Like, there's a problem doing things like a girl. These were parts of my identity that I tried to deny by shifting and assimilating and hiding myself, trying to be respectable. I wasn't going to be that kind of black person. I was going to be the respectable one that people would see. I wasn't going to be loud and angry. I was going to be eloquent and articulate. I learned the language and how to push down the anger how to keep it together when they said things about how well-spoken I was, even though I know they were actually leaving off for a black girl. And I struggled to be me, even with my own people, who sometimes told me I just wasn't black enough. Give me your card. Who made me think that my education had moved me to a place that I wasn't black anymore. I felt like the children in Queen of Akatawa, a ghost who fits in no place at all. I wonder if Esther felt that way. I've wondered if you've ever felt that way. Part of our struggle for identity requires a grappling with the various parts of our identity we've hidden even from ourselves. Part of our identity has to be for us to be able to put it before God and believe that God still says it's good. When I realized that there was no one way to be a black woman, I began to embrace me. When I realized that those were good, not bad parts of me, I could begin to embrace me. When I realized, like Mordecai and Esther, no amount of upper mobility and education could shield me from systematic injustice, I began to just be me. When I realized it didn't matter what letters I had in front or behind my name, I began to embrace me more fully. And this allows me to stand and say things normally I just would not say. It's helped me to know that I am a thought in the mind of God, that my name is written in the palm of God's hand. Beloved, that takes time, but I believe we need to do it. It's a struggle between our public persona and our shadow existence that each of us struggle to allow exists. That's what I think the movie Us is all about. This has meant I've had to let my private self come and dwell in the public spaces, even in spaces where folks may not want me to be. And to freely leave places where I just feel like I'm not giving myself up for this. And Esther, I believe we are seeing her prepare to stand, preparing to lead. And within that, there is a reconciliation that is taking place within her. She can't stand because it's popular or trending. You can't stand for what you don't know. You can't stand when you don't know who you are. To stand for injustice requires an inner strength, a faith, and a recalling of whom God has been for you, for your people. That's what Esther does, and that's what we're called to as well. 
So she reconnects to her community and links herself back as she immerses herself into her heritage, both her faith and her ethnicity, and begins to pull back pieces of herself that she's lost along the way. And maybe some pieces will never be recovered, but she tries as she may. And beloved, I don't believe that whole saying that, you know, if it doesn't kill us, it just makes us stronger. It still takes a toll. And so in this moment, in this time, she makes a choice knowing that there will be a toll exacted upon her body. To seek the face of God, to find strength and courage outside of herself and in God. To understand more fully why she's been placed in this position. To understand more fully what it is she must do. To understand more fully who she is. So too, I believe God is asking us to do the same. Our faith journey is a journey of becoming the people of God who follow after God, becoming the children of God, whose personhood is affirmed in God and God alone. Beloved, what is God preparing you to stand for? What is God calling you to begin to reconcile within yourself? It's not just for women or people of color. It's for all of us. We've all lived into these norms, and God is asking us to be reconciled to how he has defined us, not the world. We must know who God says we are. It's in God and God alone that we find our identity. So may we find strength to face ourselves so that we can stand and do the things that God is calling us to do when he's asked us to be his hands and feet in the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you see us, that you know us, that you call us. We ask, God, that you would continue to begin to bring to mind those things that we've hidden even from ourselves. Help us to have eyes to see inwardly and outwardly. Help us to see within the world the ways in which these edicts are going out against your people, our brothers and sisters. And help us to begin to see how we might have been placed in whatever position for such a time as this. Help us, God. All of creation is moaning and groaning for your return. And while the kingdom is coming, Lord, help us to be here apart, doing whatever we can as we seek your face and seek your kingdom. Amen.